Hello and welcome to Unacademy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. A very good morning and welcome to the daily Hindu news analysis. So let's begin today's discussion by first looking at the topics that we are going to discuss. From the international edition of the Hindu, I have chosen 11 important articles for both prelims and mains. We have three very interesting articles today that are relevant for the mains exam especially. We have an article related to agroforestry, an article related to India's healthcare institutions, particularly the doctor to population uh, ratio of India and how this can be improved with better center state relations. And we also have a column on heat waves and how heat waves as a disaster can be better managed. So these articles are very important for the mains examination and they could be relevant for prelims as well. So let's carry out a comprehensive analysis of these articles. Then we have a series of small articles important for prelims. Very interesting articles, but it's something which requires a, a basic analysis so that you're familiar with these topics and if there is any question, you should be able to easily answer them. So let's carry out a detailed analysis of today's newspaper and ensure that you don't have to go back and read the newspaper again. Because that is the very purpose of spending uh, one hour, one hour, 15 minutes on this session and ensure that you comprehensively cover your newspaper through our The Hindu Analysis. If you guys are benefiting from the initiative, do let us know through your comments, do press the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Now, before we start, please allow me to announce a few important uh, announcements for a couple of minutes. The UPSC results have recently come out and as you know, more than 1000 candidates have been uh, chosen as the top rankers and we are pleased to announce at an academy that 320 plus learners were in some way or the other part of our Unacademy IAS courses. We have had the top rankers for at least four learners in the top 10, 38 learners in top 100. Now to be more transparent here, if you look at the 320 plus toppers who have uh, taken the benefit of Unacademy IAS courses, around 66 of them were from the offline online classroom program, around 95 of them have used the Unacademy platform and around 150 plus toppers were part of the last mile interview guidance program. So this is about the success of the aspirants and the small role that we might have played in, in assisting the students. Now it makes us realize that there are thousands of other aspirants who may not be fortunate enough to access uh, such courses and we often receive mails and messages from many students from remote parts of the country that the courses are not affordable. So on this occasion, we want to ensure that we are there for such students as well. And in this regard, our management has agreed for a very special discount, a limited time offer where you stand to access our IAS courses for just a fees of under 30,000 rupees. Usually the course is priced at around 75,000. So there is a huge price drop, it's a limited time offer and it also gives you the benefit of a three month additional extension on the IAS courses. So those who are interested, those who want to seriously prepare for the examination and need some guidance, need some mentorship, we assure you we will be there for you and if the courses were unaffordable, then this is an opportunity for you. At, at the same time, we also promise that we will never compromise on quality. Just because the prices have been dropped for a short period doesn't mean the classes will change or the teachers will change. It's going to be the exactly the same program. The content would be of the highest quality, strictly in line with the UPSC exam. So these are the batches, the English, Hindi and bilingual batches which are starting and you can contact the number provided on the screen to get further details. Also, optional classes are starting history, geography and, and other important optionals. So this is something you would like to look into as well. Now, apart from that, for the upcoming prelims, we have a mega initiative that has been planned. Conquer Prelims 2024 is all set to launch from tomorrow. That is why I want to spend a couple of minutes in explaining the basic details about the course. Because in the last two days, I've seen many comments from students 
asking whether the conquer prelims crash course is free or is it paid and where exactly can they access the classes such doubts are coming up from many students so let me clarify this conquer prelims 2024 is a holistic comprehensive crash course that will help you cover the important static topics and as well as the current affairs these classes would be mcq based discussions and it will take place on the unacademy app and our youtube channel the static part of the crash course is exclusive on the unacademy app is that clear so this part of the crash course is starting tomorrow from 19th april it will go on till 7th of june so it will give you around 50 classes all these are live classes and from across subjects we will be we will be covering the important static topics through mcq based discussion so do ensure that you attend these classes live starting from tomorrow and from 1st of may the current affairs part of the crash course will start on our youtube channel right here on our youtube channel the timings are also provided the static crash course on the app is from 6 pm to 7 pm every day from 19th april and the current affairs crash course on our youtube channel which is starting from 1st may will be held live from 7 30 pm to 9 pm every day till 31st of may is that clear also take a look at the division of the classes for various subjects polity economy history etc so you get total of 50 classes for static topics and 31 classes for current affairs this will ensure that at least a good thousand topics will be covered majority of the questions in the examination will appear from the crash course itself if not directly at least indirectly so do attend the classes this is a golden period for you it's a great window of opportunity especially given that UPSC has postponed the prelims by a couple of weeks now take a look at the static crash course schedule starting from tomorrow I'll just jump through the slides you can pause the screen take a screenshot the same details are provided in the community section of our YouTube channel and also on our telegram channel as well is that clear so now how do you access these classes the special classes that will be held on the unacademy app that is a big question many students have where do we access these classes see all you have to do is download the unacademy app search for the respective faculties right and once you go to the profile page of the concerned faculty you will be able to see the listed classes and in the video description of the Hindu analysis we will add the respective links you just have to click on them and you'll be able to access all these classes so this is the schedule the st schedule for the static part of the crash course which is being held on the unacademy app so I hope this clarifies all your doubts and finally the last question is it free or paid this course is not free you have to pay us through your likes and your comments so it is absolutely free of cost. You don't have to pay anything for attending these classes. It's a free crash course for everyone, both uh, the static crash course on the app and the current affairs crash course on YouTube. Both are absolutely free of cost. But please pay us through your likes, your comments and, and get the results. That would make us the happiest. So let me know what you think about these initiatives in the comments. And with that, let's get started with the analysis of today's The Hindu Newspaper. Let's look at this important article on page number seven that deals with the topic of agroforestry. Let's understand what exactly is agroforestry. Why is it significant? Are there any challenges in implementing agroforestry in India? Are there any specific uh, schemes and initiatives uh, with regard to agroforestry in India? This is something we have to understand. See, agroforestry is actually a farming practice it's it's a type of land use um, method or practice in agriculture where wooded trees are cultivated by farmers on their farmland itself usually farmers grow a variety of crops right and in between the cropland or on the outskirts of the the farmland wooded trees or even uh, shrubs and and other such tall uh, trees and and materials which which have uh, economic value or social value they are cultivated they are practiced as part of agriculture so 
promoting forestry, creating these forests, these wooded forests within a cropland or a farmland is agroforestry. Now, if you look at India's agricultural systems, historically, it has been a diversified agricultural system. We have not only cultivated crops, especially food crops and other commercial crops, but we have also integrated forestry, that is cultivation of trees, wooded trees and even livestock and cattle into our farming systems. So traditionally, Indian agriculture has been very diversified. In fact, most ancient medieval cultures, they all would have practiced a diversified form of agriculture, which not only focuses on growing crops, food and commercial crops, but that integrates the cultivation of trees and forests, which serve a social and economic purpose, along with breeding livestock and cattle. So this form of diversified integrated cropping is what sustains our rural agriculture, rural economy. But in India, this system was destroyed to an extent during the Green Revolution. In 1940s, 1950s, India was facing a dire crisis with regard to food security in the country. Famines had hit several parts of India. There was critical food shortage. India was dependent on food imports. And this pushed the Indian government and several Indian scientists and researchers, including M.S. Swaminathan, to find solutions to India's food problem. The goal was to improve our agricultural productivity. So, during the Green Revolution of the 1960s, 1970s, new strains of rice and wheat were promoted to increase agricultural productivity. Fertilizers and other modern inputs were provided with better irrigation. So the goal was to achieve self-sufficiency with regard to basic food production in the country. So in that regard, Green Revolution was a big success. It made India self-reliant. It reduced and ended our dependency on food imports. We started producing uh, the basic food crops, especially rice, wheat, etc. And thus India became more independent with regard to food security. But there was a drawback as well. Because of Green Revolution, farmers in a way were in incentivized to grow only one kind of crop. It led to a condition called monocropping. From intercropping, where a mix of crops are grown and cultivated, along with cultivation of trees and grazing of cattle and livestock, we shifted largely towards monocropping, where only one type of crop was being grown in large tracts of land. And along with that, there were many other side effects of Green Revolution. Excessive usage of fertilizers that caused uh, pollution, right? It affected soil fertility, polluted our water bodies, it also, led to, it also led to adverse consequences due to excessive irrigation. For example, in Punjab, excessive irrigation led to increase in salinity levels. So there were few drawbacks due to Green Revolution where there was excessive usage of uh, irrigation, fertilizers and reliance on monocropping. It reduced the diversity of India's agriculture, pushed our farmers to depend on one type of crop. Now imagine what will happen if the crop is destroyed in a particular season due to adverse weather, let's say due to extreme heat or due to heavy rainfall, right? What if the crop is destroyed and if the farmers in a given region are dependent entirely on just one type of crop? So if that crop is destroyed for a particular season, then all those farmers, thousands, lakhs of farmers in that region, their livelihood will be completely uprooted. So this is where a need was felt to further diversify India's agriculture and bring back the traditional land use patterns. Instead of just cultivating one type of crop or few types of crops, there was an urgent need to diversify our agriculture, our rural agrarian economy. To ensure that multiple crops are grown, intercropping is done, along with cultivation of forests. When I say forests, I'm referring to wooded trees and even uh, other shrubs, forest uh, kind of shrubs, which serve a socio-economic value, which can provide additional income to the farmers, which can provide social and other economic benefits, ecological benefits to the farmers who are cultivating these trees, these wooded trees as part of agroforestry. 
So from 1970s, 1980s itself, the Indian government started promoting the practice of agroforestry. In order to diversify the land use pattern, along with promoting intercropping to push the farmers away from monocropping, we started promoting agroforestry and animal husbandry as well. So if agroforestry has been promoted as a way to diversify uh, agriculture and land use uh, systems, then there must be some advantages, some benefits associated with it, right? There has to be certain advantages due, arising out of agroforestry or else why, why would it be promoted by the government? So let's understand what exactly is it, how does it help the farmers, how does it help the country, how does it help the rural economy? Let's understand this. See, in agroforestry, you are basically clubbing your regular agriculture with for cultivation of wooded trees and forests along with promotion of animal husbandry. So this diversification ensures that the land is used in a more sustainable, efficient manner and it creates alternate channels of income for the farmers. It naturally acts as a protection against crop failure. Plus, it provides number of environmental benefits. It provides numerous social and economic benefits to the farmers and the rural economy. And more importantly, it serves the ecological purpose as well. So agroforestry has many benefits. So no wonder it has been traditionally practiced since centuries. But due to modern agriculture, this had been disrupted. And that is why in the last few decades, there is a proactive push by the government to promote agroforestry. So cultivation of wooded trees and shrubs, integrating them into the farmland itself is being promoted as a dedicated initiative. This will increase agricultural productivity. I'll explain how. It will increase profitability, bringing more income to the farmers. It will diversify the rural agrarian economy and it will provide ecological benefits, environmental benefits and it will make farming more sustainable. So let's understand these benefits in detail because you can get a main question here asking you to explain what is agroforestry and why it has to be promoted. What are its advantages? One advantage of agroforestry is that the wooded trees, right, they are a raw material. When, when it is harvested, it can be used as fuel wood and timber. Timber for furniture industry and fuel wood for cooking purposes. Of course, it is not very efficient. It has its own side effects. But you can't ignore the fact that number of rural kitchens, even today, rely on fuel wood. Of course, it causes indoor air pollution. It's, it affects uh, the health of uh, women in particular as they're confined uh, to kitchens and, and they're exposed to harmful uh, pollutants, including particulate matter. But it is a fact that fuel wood is a major raw material. Timber is a major raw material. So this can fetch economic benefits for the farmers. It can provide them a cooking fuel. They can monetize the, the timber in the local markets, push it towards the furniture industry, the, the wood industry, and thus raise alternate income that can sustain rural families. Apart from that, the trees which are grown as part of agroforestry can provide many other products and services. For example, you can grow native trees which might give or produce fruits, berries, etc., which has a lot of commercial value. So farmers can harvest the produce and sell it in the local markets, which brings them an additional source of income, a supplementary income. Right? Or forests can be promoted as part of agriculture for recreational purposes as well, to improve the tourist potential, to improve the aesthetic value of a region. Right? So it can provide a number of products and services which can be monetized that can bring supplementary income for the farmers. It also plays a role in guaranteeing food and nutritional security. Because see, on one hand, certain trees, they can produce fruits, as I was mentioning, right? This itself can play a role in food security. And more importantly, cultivation of trees within the farmland can increase soil fertility. It can improve agricultural productivity, thus guaranteeing food and nutritional security. 
because these hard wooded trees right they grow for several years and throughout their life cycle they keep shedding the leaves all the organic matter the mulch which gets collected on the uh, on the top layer of the soil right it will decompose act as a natural fertilizer and increases the organic content increases the availability of essential nutrients in the soil there are certain native trees which can even uh, fix nitrogen into into the soil system thus reducing our dependency on fertilizers so farmers can reduce their dependency on fertilizers improve soil fertility and thus increase agricultural productivity since a uh, intercropping pattern will be followed where certain crops will be grown along with the wooded trees the improved fertility will help the other crops which are being cultivated in the same patch of land so this will guarantee food and nutritional security so essentially alternate income is generated for our farmers rural livelihood is supported farm labor which is hired by farmers to maintain the crops they will get more job opportunities as well especially landless peasants right who are working as laborers for other farmers they will get more work opportunities creating alternate income for them it becomes an insurance against crop failure as i was discussing crops could fail due to any reason due to pests due to adverse weather right failed monsoons and in such cases these alternate sources of income become an ins become an insurance against crop failure then don't forget the ecological benefit the environmental benefit it will increase the green cover it will help in tackling pollution it will contribute in carbon sequestration it becomes a carbon sink helps in removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere and more importantly it will mitigate desertification it will protect the quality of the land it will protect the top layer of the soil from the elements of nature it will prevent erosion through wind water etc and thus it mitigates desertification as well and protects the quality of the land so these are some enormous benefits that arise out of agroforestry so that is the reason why the government promotes agroforestry proactively especially for small and marginal farmers if you look at india's land holding pattern majority of our farmers are small and marginal farmers they hold on to very small patches of land right in india agricultural land is highly fragmented so small and marginal farmers have very limited sources of revenue and if they can practice agroforestry along with the crops that they are growing if they can even integrate livestock and cattle uh, into their farming practices then they will have multiple streams of revenue which will sustain their families even when the regular crops fail so promoting agroforestry with focus on small and marginal farmers is critical to safeguard the rural economy of india and to protect the small and marginal farmers so that is the reason why we have a dedicated policy towards agroforestry since 1970s 1980s agroforestry has been promoted through various uh, schemes and initiatives but in 2014 a dedicated policy was introduced with this india became the first country in the world to have an exclusive policy on agroforestry the national agroforestry policy was brought out in 2014 and in 2016 a sub mission on agroforestry was launched with a dedicated allocation of 1000 crore rupees the modi government has given agroforestry at most priority and it has made this a national agenda with a slogan har med par par ped basically ensure that there are trees on every field ensure that in every farmland wooded trees are also cultivated and grown because they offer enormous socio economic benefits to the rural economy in the 2022-23 union budget special allocation was made for promoting agroforestry so ministry of agriculture is proactively involved in promoting agroforestry it works closely with ministry of rural development and panchayati raj institutions and this is promoted as a community exercise at the gram sabha level at the village level promoting agroforestry has become a social cause where the grassroot institutions the pris play a critical role in assisting the farmers but recently 
द सब मिशन हैज बिन मर्ज विथ राष्ट्रीय कृषि विकास योजना नाउ दिस माइट बी अ कंसर्न बिकॉज अंटिल रिसेंटली देर वॉज अ सेपरेट सब मिशन अ सेपरेट सब मिशन ऑन एग्रो फॉरेस्ट्री विच वॉज इंप्लीमेंटेड बाई मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ एग्रीकल्चर सो देर वॉज अ सेपरेट इंप्लीमेंटेशन आर्म फॉर एग्रो फॉरेस्ट्री इनिशियटिव बट नाउ इट हैज बिन मर्ज विथ द लार्जर स्कीम द राष्ट्रीय कृषि विकास योजना एंड दिस हैज रेज कंसर्न बिकॉज देर मे नॉट बी एक्सक्लूसिव फोकस ऑन इंप्लीमेंटिंग एग्रो फॉरेस्ट्री इन इंडिया बट द गवर्नमेंट हैज अश्योर्ड दैट द फाइनेंशियल सपोर्ट विल कंटिन्यू even at the state level at district level at panchayat level as well there is lot of focus on promoting agroforestry as part of this mission on agroforestry now there is a joint initiative that india is carrying out with a global uh, developmental organization which is called trees outside of forest india please note this down it could be important for your prelims it's a agroforestry initiative taken up by india's ministry of environment forest and climate change in association with us aid the us agency for international development it's a developmental agency that provides uh, funds and assistance to developing and poor countries to focus on developmental initiatives right it's partly funded by the us government as well so us aid has tied up with india's ministry of environment forest and climate change to implement this joint initiative between india and us the trees outside of forest india initiative now coming to my last point despite all the focus on agroforestry there are many challenges being faced in promoting agroforestry one big challenge is water availability because you might know that certain trees especially the the taller variant of uh, wooded trees initially in the sapling stage they consume a lot of water if you don't provide adequate water supply the tree will not survive it will not sustain in the initial stages so water consumption is a concern here because we already have water shortage with regard to regular crops for our food crops and cash crops we already have a big water shortage right most farmers in india are dependent on monsoon rainfall irrigation facilities are limited underground water has been over exploited so water availability is a big challenge and a concern because it no, it should not lead to a situation where the promotion of agroforestry creates more water shortage for your regular crops there should not be a direct competition between your regular crops and agroforestry where water plays a critical role now let me give you an example you might have seen eucalyptus trees everywhere especially in southern india also called the nilgiri trees it's actually the eucalyptus the eucalyptus trees also colloquially known as the nilgiris right or the nilgiri trees it has a very good fragrance uh, the uh, eucalyptus tree oil has lot of uh, medicinal cosmetic properties and it has lot of commercial application but did you know that eucalyptus is not native to india it's actually a alien species it was introduced by the british and it became a, a a practice to grow this across large tracts of land because of its uh, value commercial value the wooded tree of eucalyptus has lot of timber potential in the furniture industry in the wood industry plus the eucalyptus tree leaves can be used to extract the oil right which has lot of medicinal cosmetic purposes in the industry so many farmers many in local communities tribal communities they have cleared forest land they have cleared their uh, farmland as well and cultivated eucalyptus on a large scale as an entire block now this is not sustainable again you can't clear forests or forget other crops and grow only certain commercial trees this will weaken the ecosystem it will weaken the biodiversity and these non native species can be a threat to our ecosystems in southern india especially eucalyptus plantations has become a headache these non native species are causing environmental problems it has reduced the availability of uh, food for herbivores elephants deer and other herbivores they don't have sufficient edible leaves available because native trees have been destroyed and 
non native species like eucalyptus have been cultivated on a massive scale and they have propagated they have become an invasive uh, species right so this is a concern so there should never be a direct competition here between your regular crops and the agroforestry uh, initiative right water availability is a concern and ensuring that non native species is not introduced is another challenge because many farmers what they do is because they get some incentives to go to grow uh, trees and uh, forest cover within the farmland they are incentivized to grow fast growing trees to get quick economic benefits they want to grow those kind of trees which grow quickly and which can even maybe repel uh, pests and other herbivores the problem here is that native species are not having these characteristics so what farmers do is they rely on non native species of trees and when this propagates it could end up becoming an invasive alien species that will weaken our weak, uh, ecosystems many farmers have tried to protect their crops from various herbivores especially from elephants deers etc they have deliberately cut down the native trees which provide edible leaves and they have grown eucalyptus and other fast growing trees which are non native so this reduces the availability of food for the herbivores plus it has a detrimental environmental impact it weakens the biodiversity is that clear so it's important to promote native species of trees which can actually provide socio economic benefits and ecological benefits ensure that there is no water shortage and adequate water is made available and there should never be a diversion of water from crops towards agroforestry that should not happen this competition should be managed so that is where farmers need institutional support systematic support is needed apart from financial incentives the government has to promote awareness provide training and also create market linkages so that the tree produce can be harvested and monetized in the market farmers should know what product to harvest how to sell the logistics have to be in place the market system has to be in place to ensure that these trees which are being cultivated under agroforestry is beneficial to our farming community so this is the support structure that ha that has to be created by the government from providing financial incentives to spreading awareness promoting training providing uh, saplings of native trees right encouraging the cultivation of native trees over non native species and creating market linkages this is what is essential and the focus should always be on the small land holders small and marginal farmers should be the priority for the government so there is one concern here last year we launched a certification scheme called india forest and wood certification scheme to certify the quality of wood uh, which is being traded in the timber market indian forest and wood certification scheme 2023 was launched which grades the wood quality and accordingly it fetches a market price now problem is that in this certification scheme there is a very strict eligibility criteria not just for the quality of the wood but even for the farmers who are growing it now the eligibility criteria is so strict that small marginal farmers may not be able to meet the criteria it might benefit large farmers and industries but it may not benefit small marginal farmers so these are the kind of issues which needs to be addressed if we have to fully capitalize the potential of agroforestry it definitely has enormous socio economic benefits we just need better policies better intervention from the government so that is what we understand from this important article now let's look at an editorial from page number 8 this editorial deals with india's healthcare sector it is focused on medical education in the country this is the focus area of the editorial so let's understand what the editorial is talking about see the editorial is expressing concern about the poor doctor to population ratio in india in india we have very few doctors given the size of our population according to official data from the ministry of health our doctor to population ratio is 1 is to 834 that is for every 834 people there is only one doctor available this doctor to population ratio is very poor when compared to other economies other developed countries 
This, of course, has an impact on the quality of healthcare, on accessibility to healthcare, right? Even the affordability factor uh, gets affected when you have fewer doctors uh, compared to your population size. Basically, there is a demand supply mismatch with regard to doctors. We are not producing enough number of doctors and quality doctors who can meet the demand in the healthcare sector. Is that clear? So there is a big mismatch and for this purpose, we have to focus on medical education, which means we need more medical institutions, medical colleges to be established, which can offer MBBS degrees and specialized courses so that we can produce more doctors to match the demand in India's healthcare sector. So for this purpose, a scheme was launched in 2003 by the then Vajpayee government. It's called Pradhan Mantri Swasthya Suraksha Yojana. One of the primary focus of this scheme was to bridge the demand supply gap with regard to doctors in India. The primary focus was to set up more medical institutions and elite medical colleges so that we can produce more quality doctors to ensure that we have an ideal doctor to population ratio. This scheme was later launched in 2006 by the Manmohan Singh government. It was conceptualized and initiated under Vajpayee government and by 2006, it was implemented by the Manmohan Singh government. So under the scheme, the government's focus was on establishing elite medical colleges and institutions on the lines of AIMS, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, which is based out of New Delhi. So six AIMS-like institutions were planned to come up across different parts of India to create more vacancies in medical colleges and provide advanced facilities and research uh, infrastructure so that we can promote medical education. Now, this scheme has been further taken forward by the Modi government as well. And today, we have around 20 aims like institutions which are already functional. There are few more which are under construction, under development. So, across India, several aims like medical institutions have been set up. If you know about aims, it's not just a hospital, right? It's not just a super speciality hospital. It's a, a top elite medical college, an institution that specializes in the field of healthcare and focuses on research and development as well. So establishing such elite institutions will definitely create the necessary infrastructure, the, the base that is needed to produce quality doctors in India, right? There's no doubt about that. So the initiative has the right focus, but problem is in implementation. When it comes to setting up these aims like institutions, several problems and challenges have come up. For example, the new aims like institutions which have been set up in the last few years, many of them do not have the right infrastructure. Even though hundreds of crore, crores of rupees have been spent, they have not been provided with adequate facilities, adequate equipment and infrastructure. And more importantly, there are doubts expressed about the quality of medical education being imparted in these institutions. Now, this is where the writer points out, that is essentially the editorial team of the Hindu points out, that the standoff between the central government and state governments has something to do with the poor quality of these aims like institutions. See, what has happened is that public health is a state subject in India. If you look at Schedule 7 of the Indian Constitution, right? Public health is a state subject, meaning state governments have the primary responsibility to look after public health. But the center plays a critical role in supplementing the resources of the state, especially when it comes to medical infrastructure, healthcare infrastructure, medical education. The center plays a supplementary role. So as a result, there is often a tug of war between center and states, especially when there are different parties ruling at the center and the, at the state level, right? Let's say there is one ruling party at the center and at the state, there are opposition parties in power. So this political standoff affects the establishment and operation of these medical institutions. Now take the example of Tamil Nadu and Ames Madurai, which is coming up. The editorial is specifically taking this example because this has become 
a point of contestation between the center and the state. The center has been trying to push for the establishment of AIMS Madurai. It has uh, funded the project. Recently, the foundation stone was laid by Prime Minister Modi as well. But the state government has issues and concerns with the meddling, interfering nature of the center. So the poor center-state relations, right, which is largely a political uh, issue, has affected the implementation of this particular scheme. The establishment, running and maintenance of AIMS-like institutions has been affected due to poor center-state relations, due to the divide between the center and opposition-ruled states. So this is something the editorial is highlighting. The editorial is urging the center and as well as the states to focus on common goals and objectives. To ensure that such elite institutions are given the right funds, the required land, the required infrastructure, facilities and, and any required support. To ensure that quality education is imparted to produce not just more doctors, but to produce quality doctors. So that is the crux of the editorial. Is that clear? So with this, we will come to the next column, the last big article for today. So we have this column on page number 10, which is important for geography and as well as for disaster management and even for environment and ecology. This article is dealing with the topic of heat waves. Right now, during the summer season, India is in the midst of um, severe heat waves across the country especially in northern, northwestern part of India, central and even uh, southern parts of India. Severe heat waves have gripped large parts of the country and this is a notified disaster. It is recognized as a disaster under the Disaster Management Act of 2005. Heat waves are a notified disaster under the National Disaster Management Plan and the National Disaster Management Policy, which have been brought out under the Disaster Management Act. So the NDMA, National Disaster Management Authority, which is the nodal authority for disaster management, pays a lot of attention to deal with disasters like heat waves. Right? So first let's understand what exactly is a heat wave, right? which is the nodal institution responsible for giving early warning alerts, forecasting and early warning alerts. What is the criteria to define uh, the start of a heat wave? Right, That is something we have to understand. Next, we have to understand the impact. What happens when you are exposed to such heat wave conditions? What is the uh, impact on humans? What's the impact on the environment? And what is the economic, economic impact of such a disaster? Right, And then we will discuss the mitigation plans, the preparedness uh, that India has, has put in place to deal with this particular disaster. See, when it comes to declaring a heat wave, the early warning agency, the nodal early warning agency is the IMD, India Meteorological Department, which comes under the Ministry of Earth Sciences. So IMD is the nodal early warning agency. So IMD has come out with a definition to define heat waves and to declare the start of a heat wave condition. According to IMD's definition, the start of a heat wave it varies from region to region, depending on the physiography of that region. Particularly, the terrain and the altitude of a particular region plays a big role in the extent of heat that you experience. When it comes to the adverse uh, effects of heat-related stress, what you experience varies from place to place, depending on the terrain, depending on the physiography, especially the altitude of the place. Right? How high is it above sea level plays a critical role. Because the physiography of a place will determine the humidity levels, uh, the overall uh, temperature effect in a given region. It varies from a coastal plain to a hilly area to a plain area. Right? For example, you go to uh, anywhere in coastal India, right, from Chennai to Mumbai, right? you, you know the kind of oppressive uh, heat that exists. Right, the extremely humid uh, environment that you experience there. Or you go to, let's say, uh, plain areas like, let's say, Delhi or uh, the plains of uh, Uttar Pradesh. What you experience there is very different. It's a more uh, dry heat with very less uh, humidity. You go to, let's say, cities like uh, Bengaluru, which are located at a certain uh, altitude. Right, The heat you experience there is very different. 
right? You go to hill stations, let's say Uti or, or Shimla, Manali, right? The heat experience there is very different because the terrain, the physiography plays a big role. So accordingly, IMD has developed a certain criteria for different places. Now, in a plain area, if a heat wave has to be considered, even to consider the threshold is 40 degrees Celsius and above. Below that, there can't be a heat wave in a plain area. So in a plain area, the threshold is 40 degrees Celsius and above to even consider whether a heat wave should be declared or not. For coastal plains, it is 37 degrees Celsius or more. For hilly areas, it is 30 degrees Celsius or more. This is the threshold. All right. Now, if the actual maximum temperature of a given place crosses the normal maximum temperature of that place by a certain margin, only then a heat wave is declared. Is that clear? So this is the minimum threshold, the minimum criteria for plains, coastal areas and hilly areas. Beyond this, if there is a significant departure in the actual maximum temperature measured at that place, compared to the normal maximum temperature expected, only then a heat wave alert is issued. Now, the severity of the heat wave depends on the extent of the departure. By what extent is the actual maximum temperature AMT is departing from NMT, from normal maximum temperature? Let's say the departure is by 4.5 to 6.4 degrees Celsius. Then it is just a normal heat wave. Let's say, for example, let's take a plain area like Delhi. All right. So here the threshold to even consider a heat wave is 40 degrees or more. Let's say, for example, in the month of April, the normal maximum temperature expected in Delhi is around 41 degrees Celsius. But in a particular week of April, let's say the actual maximum temperature recorded was 45 to 46 degrees Celsius which means there is a significant departure. First, the threshold criteria has been met. For a plain area, it's already 40 degrees and above. So heat wave can be considered. And there is a significant departure of 4 to 5 degrees, which means it is a heat wave condition which has started. So a normal heat wave is declared by IMD. But if the departure is above 6.4 degrees Celsius, right, then a severe heat wave alert is issued. Let's say the temperature measured in Delhi is hitting 48 degrees when it is supposed to be 41. When this is recorded, then a severe heat wave alert is issued by the IMD. And also, for recording the temperature, there is a criteria. This temperature has to be recorded for two consecutive days at two stations in a meteorological subdivision. Only then the IMD issues a heat wave alert. Is that clear? So there can be a prelims question as well based on uh, the criteria to identify a heat wave. So now let's quickly understand the impact, right? How it becomes a disaster and what are we doing to deal with the disaster? See, the biggest concern with heat wave is the physiological stress on all organisms, not just human beings. If you take humans, for example, when you're exposed to such extreme heat, right, especially during the peak hours, let's say from 10 a.m. itself, going all the way till 4 p.m. or 5 p.m., but the intense uh, heat being experienced between 12 p.m. to uh, 4 p.m., right? If you have a higher exposure to that, right, then your body could suffer from severe dehydration. Your body will lose uh, fluids to maintain the core body temperature, right? Our bodies are designed to function at a certain uh, ideal temperature range, which we refer to as the core body temperature, right? It shouldn't be uh, too hot, neither too cold, right? That is the ideal uh, temperature for our physiological functions to be carried out. Now, our body has a, a natural mechanism of moderating the, the core internal temperature, right? When it is extremely hot, right? To prevent the heating up uh, from the inside, the body starts sweating, right? The excess heat is expelled in the form of sweat. And that is where you lose your water con content. That's where you get dehydrated. You lose the body fluids and more importantly, you lose uh, important electrolytes as well, right? So this could lead to very dangerous consequences. Let's say, for example, there is an athlete 
a sports person, a cricketer, right, who who's exposed to such heat, they're playing intensely or exercising intensely in such a uh, oppressive uh, heat wave environment, then they are at the risk of not just dehydration, but continued dehydration could lead to other disastrous consequences. It can cause heat stroke, right? We say that such a person is suffering from heat stress and it could result in a heat stroke. So excessive dehydration can lead to nausea, a sensation of vomiting, headache, confusion, and it could further deteriorate very quickly, leading to muscle cramps due to excessive dehydration and loss of uh, essential salts and uh, electrolytes. It can cause muscle cramps. You might have seen how athletes struggle uh, in, a, in a very oppressive region, right? Just after a few hours of playing, they, they suffer from muscle cramps. They, they are forced to retire from the game itself. So this is usually due to dehydration as a result of heat stress. And if it is not addressed, right? If they don't receive timely care and treatment, it could escalate to become a heat stroke where the core body temperature will start shooting up beyond the normal levels and it could affect internal organs. It could eventually lead to multi-organ failure causing cardiac arrest and leading to the death of the person. So many people lose their lives because of heat waves. And usually the most affected here are the poor people, right? Apart from athletes and others who because of their profession, right? Uh, because of that, they get exposed to uh, such extreme heat. Apart from them, it's usually the manual workers, the construction workers, street vendors. They are forced to come out in the open and work because that is their livelihood. Daily wage earners, construction workers, those who lift heavy loads in the, in the oppressive heat, those who pull uh, rickshaws and carts and lift uh, weights and materials. Right? So they are at the biggest risk of suffering from heat stress, heat stroke and eventual death as well. So in that regard, heat waves have a disproportionate impact on the poor and marginal marginalized classes. Because those who are from the richer sections, be it the elite, the upper class or even the middle class, lower middle class as well, you can always afford cooling solutions and shelter. Right? If there is excessive heat, Right? If you feel uh, tired, if you feel dehydrated, you can have access to clean drinking water. You can have access to other uh, fluids from tender coconut to electrolyte drinks, etc. You can sit in a shade. Right? You can have access to cooling solutions like fans, air conditioners, etc. So that is what uh, protects uh, people who have access to, to such facilities. But think of a street vendor, a construction worker, a rickshaw puller who have no access to such facilities. So if they don't get these, these facilities on time and if they are constantly exposed to such conditions, they are at risk of even losing their lives due to heat stroke. So dehydration, heat stress is very common during heat wave uh, conditions and heat stroke becomes um, the eventual consequence. So every summer, several people lose their lives in India and majority of them are from the lower classes. So this shows the socio-economic impact of the disaster. Hundreds of people in India actually lose their lives. So they need to reach out immediately, get the right treatment. This is a serious healthcare condition, right? So even the doctors need to be equipped at the primary level to identify the condition, give them the right uh, treatment. They have to provide the required fluids, electrolytes, and, and ensure that the, the core body temperature is brought down. So or else, uh, such people, right, who are suffering from heat stress and, and heat stroke, they will end up losing their lives. Now, that is the reason why heat wave is a significant disaster. So it has a direct impact on human life. It can result in loss of lives. It has a huge economic impact as well. Because of cooling demand, you need more refrigeration, more air conditioning, more fans, more coolers. So obviously, energy demand shoots up, electricity demand shoots up. Correct? So India is largely importing energy from coal to gas uh, to oil. We largely import most of our energy sources. Our import bills might shoot up. The demand for electricity will increase. It could have many other adverse consequences. Infrastructure could get damaged, especially railway lines. They undergo expansion under such extreme heat conditions. It could even crack the railway lines and it could result in fractures and accidents, train accidents eventually. It is disastrous for crops, right? It could destroy the standing crops, wipe out the rural economy 
and it could dry up the water sources as well. This could lead to prevalence of various pests and pathogens and spread diseases in the region. Because when water is stagnant or when there is minimal water, right, along with arid conditions being prevalent, it could become a fertile ground for breeding ground for various pathogens that can cause infectious diseases. So it has a huge socio-economic impact. In fact, it's a silent disaster. It's not as dramatic as an earthquake or a cyclone or a flood, right? We usually are attracted to more spontaneous events. That's human nature, human psychology. But this is a silent killer. It's happening right under, under our eyes, but we don't pay attention to it because it's not happening to you. It's not happening to me. It's not happening to our family members because most of us can afford basic shelter, basic uh, water facilities and basic cooling solutions. But there are millions of people in the country who don't have access to this, who can't afford cooling solutions and, and uh, adequate shelter facilities and water facilities. This is where the government plays a big role in tackling the disaster. With adequate planning and preparation, right? with focus on the DM cycle, the disaster management cycle, if you plan and prepare in the pre-disaster phase and if you take the right measures during disaster and if you focus on post-disaster management, then you can definitely minimize the impact. You can mitigate. See, preventing a heat wave may not be possible, but definitely mitigation is possible. We can reduce the impact on human lives we can ensure that there are no deaths. Deaths are preventable, absolutely preventable. We can ensure that the economic losses, the social uh, impact is mitigated and reduced. So that is why there is a heat action plan that has been developed at all the three tiers of the government. From the center, to the state, to the district level. At all the three tiers of the administration, heat action plans are being developed under the guidance of National Disaster Management Authority. The NDMA is working with the center, the state governments and district level authorities. Right? So it works with the state disaster management authority and the district disaster management authority. These are the three disaster management institutions created through the Disaster Management Act. So heat action plans have been developed. It's basically a guideline, a set of guidelines to deal with heat wave conditions. So under the heat action plan, the initial focus is on vulnerability assessment. This is one of the basic steps in disaster management. When you're planning and preparing for a disaster in the pre-disaster phase, the first thing you do is to understand the hazard, that is the risk or the threat, and then understand the vulnerability of a particular region. So this requires careful studies of historical data. It requires scientific research. Through that, you develop a hazard map. You develop the vulnerability profile of the country and identify the hotspots. Identify which regions are more prone, more vulnerable, and accordingly, you can take adequate measures. The next important step after vulnerability assessment, after vulnerability assessment, the next important step here would be early warning systems. This is the next important step in disaster management in the pre-disaster uh, phase of planning and preparedness. So here we have IMD, India Meteorological Department, which acts as the nodal early warning agency. It provides accurate weather forecasts, tracks the temperature levels, looks at the temperature departure which is happening in different uh, parts of the country and accordingly issues a heat wave alert. These alerts are very, very useful for the authorities and for the people as well. Correct? The concerned authorities from the center to the state to the district level, they can all take basic measures, preventive measures during the disaster. For example, spread awareness about the heat wave. Engage all media platforms. The government authorities, disaster management authorities, they have to work with social media platforms. They have to leverage uh, social media platforms. They'll have to work with newspapers, TV channels, radio uh, channels, and spread the message that there is a heat wave coming up for these many days. Advise the people what to do, what not to do. Next, create shelter facilities. 
Now, this has to be done in the pre-disaster phase. You can't wait for the disaster to occur. Even before disaster can occur, based on your vulnerability assessment, in the most risk-prone areas, create shelter facilities. Provide water facilities. Provide cooling solutions in public places. Right? So create more shelters where people can take rest during the peak of the heat wave in the afternoon. Provide public water facilities. Provide cooling solutions wherever possible. Then encourage the private sector, the businesses, to adopt certain basic practices, especially in the construction sector, right? And in other sectors where daily manual laborers are employed, they could be given a time off. They could be given rest for few hours during the peak of the heat wave. They can be made to work in the early hours of the morning or during later part of the evening. And during the afternoon, they can be given a time off, a rest, so that their body is not put under undue stress. Correct? And encourage more better uh, practices, wearing loose clothing, right? Educating people about the importance of hydration, why you should drink uh, more water regularly, consume more fluids, consume electrolytes, right? This is basic awareness along with these uh, structural measures that are needed. So with these steps, it is possible to mitigate the impact of heat wave and definitely prevent the deaths occurring due to heat wave. That is what heat action plans deal with. It's a set of guidelines, disaster management guidelines brought out at the central level, at the state level and district level. And this is already being implemented. Understood? So th that is what the article is talking about. So now let's head towards the prelim section and look at the smaller articles. It will only take few minutes because all these are small articles. But however, the topics are very crucial, very important for the prelims. On page number one, we actually have two articles referring to the silence period that kicks into effect 48 hours before elections, before polling. The first phase of India's general elections, they're all set to be held in a couple of days. The 48 hour window has begun and from today, political parties and leaders, candidates, they are prohibited by the election commission from conducting any kind of campaign. As part of the model code of conduct to ensure that free and fair elections, transparent elections are held, to ensure that parties and candidates don't uh, exercise any undue influence or stress on voters to mislead them, to push them to vote for them. This period of 48 hours before the polling begins, right, has been set aside as a silence period. This is defined under section 126 of the Representation of People Act. Section 126 of RPA provides for a silence period that begins 48 hours before polling. So it prohibits all kinds of rallies, public campaigns and, and public appeals for votes. So all the candidates, political parties, they have to abide by this. Till the polling ends, right? They have to follow the silence period and it specifically applies for television and any digital media. Understood? What's interesting here is that it does not specifically apply for print, print media, that is for newspapers. There has been a proposal that print media should also be covered under this, right? And uh, there is a proposal regarding social media because it specifically does not deal with social media. It does not specifically mention uh, social media intermediaries. But every other form of campaign is actually prohibited. But there are instances where few parties and leaders violate the silence period as well. They try to influence the voters, they try to reach out to them. They try to uh, sometimes uh, distribute some benefits, either in cash or kind, to lure the voters, to attract them and push them to vote for them. Essentially, to crack down on these uh, corrupt practices, Election Commission imposes a silence period that begins 48 hours before polling day. It will continue till the end of polling, right? The whole purpose here is to maintain the sanctity of elections to ensure that voter is not under any undue influence and, and makes a clear choice, a voluntary choice when they cast their vote. 
So it applies primarily for television or some digital forms of digital media. It applies for public rallies, public uh, speeches and campaigns, but it does not specifically apply for print media and social media intermediaries. Next, on the same page, we have an article referring to the green credit program. The center has tweaked some of the norms related to the green credit program. Let's understand what is the green credit program. The green credit program was launched last year in 2023 by the Modi government. It is in line with the initiative of Prime Minister Modi, Mission Life. You might have seen PM Modi talking about Mission Life and promoting the agenda of Mission Life. Life stands for lifestyle for environment. Following a better lifestyle, adopting better practices in our day-to-day -day life to safeguard the environment, to protect the environment. This applies for individuals and organizations as well. So under the green credit program, an incentive-based program was launched last year to incentivize individuals and organizations to take up green initiatives, to take up environment-friendly initiatives. If you participate and take part in such initiatives and programs, you gain green credits, which can be monetized. You might have heard about carbon credits with regard to uh, climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. How if, uh, let's say, a company or a, a government entity, right, if they take up cleaner projects that reduces emissions, they earn carbon credits, which could be monetized in the, in the carbon markets, right, as per the previous uh, climate agreement that we had, the Kyoto Protocol, right? So similarly, there is something called Green Credit Program launched by the Indian government, which incentivizes pro-environment actions. Let's say there is a, a private company. As part of its corporate social responsibility, the company will adopt a lake, conserve and protect the lake. Or it will take up afforestation uh, measures or measures to tackle pollution, measures to protect uh, mangroves and wetlands. So such environmental actions are incentivized. They are given green credits for the actions they have taken up for restoring the ecosystem, which they can use for certain financial benefits. Even individuals are eligible for earning green credits. So pollution control programs, ecosystem restoration programs, afforestation programs, all such initiatives are recognized under the green credit program. It is administered by the Indian Council of Forestry and Education. Is that clear? So there is a small tweak which has been made by the government regarding the guidelines. The government has made it clear that to be eligible for green credits, the program or the initiative should promote restoration of ecosystems. You can't simply plant trees for the sake of it, right? And then claim that you have done an environmental action and you deserve green credits. You can't take up some random action, right? And then claim that you have contributed to the environment and ask for green credits and ask to be incentivized. It doesn't work like that. The government has clearly said that any such environmental project taken up by individuals or organizations, it should have a clear environmental purpose. It should focus on restoration of ecosystem. Let's say a wetland has been damaged, right? If a company plays a role in restoring that wetland, then that is an action which will be recognized and accordingly green credits will be awarded. So this is a, a tweak which the government has done. It has updated the guidelines to ensure that only genuine projects which are helping in the restoration of ecosystem are incentivized. Next on page four, we have an article referring to the tribal population of Madhya Pradesh from a particular region in the state called the Maha Koshal region. It's also called Maha Kaushal region or Maha Koshal region. So you should know where this region is located. There can be a map based question. See in Madhya Pradesh, you have the Bundelkhand region towards the northern part of MP that extends towards Uttar Pradesh as well. This is the Bundelkhand region, known for its backwardness, its arid conditions, known for its uh, deep ravines, high crime rate, etc. Right next to it, towards eastern Madhya Pradesh, to the east of the Narmada River, that region around Jabalpur, right? Jabalpur is the main commercial hub of this region. So some of the districts present around Jabalpur, they are part of this region called Maha Koshal or Maha Kaushal region. So please know where it is located. 
know about the geography and the demography of the place. So in the Mahakoshal region, right, you find few tribal communities belonging to the Gond, Pardan and Barya communities. These are some indigenous communities, many of them are linked to Gondwana tribes. They speak the, the Gondi language, which is, uh, which is seen across uh, central and eastern India. Right? So you have these native uh, tribes and indigenous communities present here. This region is bound by Narmada river on the west of it. So basically to the east of Narmada you find Mahakoshal region. It's bound by the Vindhyas, the Vindhya ranges in the north, uh, then Bundelkhand as well, the Malwa plateau to the northwest and you also have the Vidarbha region of Maharashtra to the, to the south. So this is where the Mahakoshal region, Mahakoshal region is located in Madhya Pradesh. It is generally considered as a tribal uh, area, a, a relatively backward area as well. Coming to another article on page 7, it refers to a unique species of frog called the leaf litter frog. You can see the image of the frog as well. It is found in the rainforests of Brazil. It's a very unique species of frog, right? So there could be a possible prelims question on this. This frog has a unique adaptation to ward off any threats and predators. If the frog, let's say, is attacked by a predator or if it faces any threat, it has a very unique mechanism. It emits a very shriek voice. It screams, essentially. And most of its screams appear to be silent for humans, right? We, when, when you look at this frog, let's say, right, it, whenever it faces a threat, it feels threatened. It opens its mouth as if it is screaming, but we don't hear anything. Because studies have established that when they scream, they emit ultra low frequencies, ultrasonic frequencies, which are not audible to the human ear. It is specifically audible for certain predators like various uh, predators, right, that threaten the frog. It scares them away, it pushes them away. And that is what is unique about this particular frog found in uh, the Brazilian rainforest. It can emit ultrasonic frequencies, extremely low level frequencies, which are below the audible range of human beings, but it's audible only for certain predators, which are a threat to this frog in this ecosystem. So that is a very unique adaptation, one of the most unique uh, defensive mechanisms that we have seen in nature and that has been established through a recent research. So there could be a potential prelims question here. Next coming to India and WTO. Recently the 13th WTO ministerial was held in Abu Dhabi. India uh, participated in this as well and India's only demand has been for a permanent solution. We have been calling for a permanent solution for public stock holding. This is a long standing issue and you need to understand this. It's very, very important. See, countries like India provide a lot of subsidy to their agriculture sector. Not just India for that matter, even developed nations provide a lot of subsidy to their farmers, to their agro industries. Developing nations like India, China and others, they also provide a lot of subsidies to their farmers and agriculture sector, basically to promote uh, the rural economy and to sustain the agriculture sector, right? to incentivize them as well. Now, this is very crucial, not just to ensure the rural livelihoods and protect the farmers and their income, but also to guarantee food security. Now, for example, one of India's biggest incentive program for farmers is MSP, minimum support price. By guaranteeing a minimum support price for variety of crops, the government is giving direct financial support for farmers, guaranteeing uh, income for farmers, protecting uh, the agriculture systems and ensuring that there is higher production of these crops so that we can maintain adequate buffer stock. We can create adequate buffer stocks and does meet our food security requirements. So we can procure these crops and distribute them under our food security programs 
distribute them under food security programs like the National Food Security Act. We have various food security related programs, the Antyodaya Anna, Anna Yojana, for example. So government can distribute free grains or subsidized grains to the larger uh, sections of the population, guarantee their food security, especially for the poor uh, population, while maintaining adequate buffer stocks. And that is why these agricultural subsidies are critical, especially for developing nations like India. It protects our agriculture systems, it protects our rural economy, our farmers, guarantees the income for them, plus it allows the government to build up the buffer stock and ensure food security in the country. Now, such practice of giving subsidies to agriculture is not tolerated as far as global trade is concerned. This is often categorized as an unfair trading practice. Under the international trade rules of WTO, this is alleged to be an unfair trading practice. So developed countries especially, the Western countries led by US and European countries, they are completely against such enormous subsidies given by developing nations like India, China, African countries and, and other developing countries. So this has been a long-standing issue. Right? They don't want subsidies for agriculture to go beyond a certain point because then the farmers in other countries, the traders in other countries, they won't be able to compete. They won't be able to access the Indian market. They won't be able to compete with uh, the cheaper produce, produced by uh, these countries. So they allege that this is an unfair trading practice and this has been a big issue at WTO. So in 2013, during the Bali Ministerial Conference in Indonesia, a temporary solution was found for this issue. A temporary solution had been worked out. Is that clear? Now, developed countries wanted cases to be filed, disputes to be filed against developing nations like India. Developing nations like India were opposing uh, the demands of the developed countries. So, in 2013, during the Bali Ministerial Conference of WTO, a temporary solution was worked out, which introduced a peace clause a peace clause had been introduced. That is, until a final solution can be found, for a temporary period, subsidies can continue. That is the peace clause. The peace clause says that subsidies for agriculture should not cross 10% of the value of production. This was the peace clause agreed to at WTO Bali Ministerial in 2013. This is only a temporary solution. So up to 10% of the total value produced in India's agriculture, we can provide subsidies. Beyond that, it is considered as unfair and disputes can be filed against India, dragging India to the WTO dispute mechanism. Is that clear? So now, India is not happy with the temporary solution. Even though we can continue with subsidies up to 10% of our value production, it's, it's not a permanent solution, right? There is always constant concern for developing nations regarding public stock holding and subsidies that they are providing. We are always worried that we, we will be accused by Western countries, developed countries that we are resorting to unfair trade practices. So that is why India is fighting for a permanent solution. We are trying to bring all developing nations together, oppose these developed countries and we are pushing for a permanent solution. We don't want a temporary peace clause. We want a permanent solution to resolve this issue forever and that is what India is reiterating. Because during the Abu Dhabi ministerial, India brought up the issue, but it didn't get enough support. We still haven't made progress regarding that. So India is pushing for a permanent solution for the public stockholding issue. Next, on page 12, we have a map related topic. The topic refers to Nagorno-Karabakh region, which is a conflicted disputed area between Azerbaijan and Armenia. So over the last few years, it, it has been a source of conflict between these two Eurasian countries. And according to the article, Russia, which was supposed to be a neutral uh, mediator, it has pulled out its peacekeeping forces from Karabakh, right? Because these regions were former Soviet territories, particularly uh, Azerbaijan and even Armenia, right? So Russia being the, the top influence here, it had deployed peacekeeping troops as well uh, to maintain uh, stability between Azerbaijan and Armenia. But last year, Azerbaijan managed to crush 
Armenian forces. It threw out most of the Armenian population and it has captured Nagorno-Karabakh. It is basically an Armenian enclave. See, this is where Nagorno-Karabakh is located. It's an enclave of Armenia where Armenian population is found, but it is surrounded by Azerbaijan, claimed by Azerbaijan. So from 1990s, it has been a source of dispute. Following the collapse of Soviet Union, following the birth of these countries, since then, Nagorno-Karabakh has been disputed. They have fought many wars and conflicts, including the latest war. And recently, Azerbaijan carried out a major offensive last year. It defeated Armenia and it has captured Nagorno-Karabakh. Understood? So the Russian troops, they did not protect uh, the enclave of Armenia. They didn't um, be neutral as expected. There has been criticism against Russia as well. Right? India has played a very interesting role. India has in a way sided with Armenia. India has been one of the biggest defense suppliers to Armenia in the last few years. We have supplied advanced weaponry from rockets to radars to missiles uh, to boost the military preparedness of Armenia. There is a geopolitical angle to this because Azerbaijan has been quite problematic for India. It has been quite hostile. It has supported Pakistan and it's very close to Turkey. Both countries have targeted India over the Kashmir issue recently at the UN and at other platforms. Right? Pakistan and even Turkey have become very hostile to India trying to internationalize the Kashmir issue. So, Azerbaijan has stood with them. It has supported Pakistan's position and Turkey's position. So, India has issues with that as well. And in a way, indirectly, if not directly, we have sided with Armenia and supplied large-scale arms and ammunition to strengthen Armenian defense. But Azerbaijan pushed out Armenian forces, defeated them, and it has captured Nagorno-Karabakh. Now, I'll give you one small assignment. There is an important land corridor that connects Armenia with this enclave. Can you identify the name of this land corridor? There is a small land corridor that links Armenia with Nagorno-Karabakh. This was in news over the last few months. So there can be a map-based question on this. So this is an exercise, a homework for you. Identify which is this land corridor. Mention that in the comments below. Next, another map-related topic, Taiwan Strait was in news. Uh, US Navy has conducted an exercise, a passage exercise near Taiwan Strait, and Taiwan's defense forces also have conducted a, a military exercise in the disputed Taiwan Strait. So you should know where exactly it is located. So Taiwan Strait is this opening present over here, this water uh, passage between mainland China and the small island, self-ruling island of Taiwan, and it links South China Sea with East China Sea. So China, which is ruled by the PRC, which is ruled by the Communist People's Republic of China, it claims sovereignty over Taiwan. This dispute dates back uh, to the Chinese Civil War of 1940s. The Communist Party had defeated the Kuomintang and threw out the then Chinese government, the Republic of China, and cornered them to the island of Taiwan. So since then, Taiwan has become a self-ruling territory claiming independence. But China claims Taiwan for itself. Right? Communist China under PRC has claimed a sovereignty over Taiwan and Taiwan is not recognized as an independent nation. So this has been a, a standing diplomatic issue, a geopolitical issue. So there are heightened tensions here near Taiwan Strait. Chinese forces, especially the PLA Navy and Air Force, they deliberately carry out incursions into Taiwanese territory. They threaten uh, Taiwan and it, China even says that eventually it's going to invade and occupy Taiwan if required. So there is a standoff going on from several decades and the United States and Western powers have stepped in and US in particular has been trying to deal with Taiwan. It's been trying to militarize Taiwan, giving military support to it, deploying its military vessels here, leading to a confrontation with China. So it's one of the hotly contested areas and this is where Taiwan Strait is located. It's this narrow water body between mainland China and Taiwan connecting South China Sea with East China Sea. So please know this, there can be a map-based question. The last topic for today, 
the Hindu carries an image on page 15 of a minority group called the Yazidi community. In this image, you see Yazidi women celebrating a local traditional festival. So you should know who are the Yazidis, right? Or Yazidis. This could come as a prelims question. The Yazidis, right? They are, they are seen as native to the Kurdish region where the Kurd community can be found. If you look at Iran, Turkey, Iraq and Syria, right? In these countries, you find a indigenous ethnic group called the Kurds. In fact, there is a, a Kurdish movement as well, particularly against the government of Turkey, where Kurdish armed groups and militant insurgent groups are fighting for independence. They want to create a separate nation for themselves called Kurdistan. UPSC has even asked a prelims question on the Kurd community, right? So there can be a, a question on Yazidis who are linked to the Kurds. So Yazidis or Yazidis, right? They represent an endogamous religious group found in this part of West Asia who are indigenous to the Kurd region, found across Iran, Iraq, Syria and Turkey. This community has faced a lot of persecution in the past especially at the hands of radical extremists. More recently, during uh, the rule of ISIS, when Islamic State captured territory in Iraq and Syria and established a so-called caliphate, Yazidi women were targeted by ISIS terrorists. Right? They were used as sexual slaves and gross human rights violations were reported against the Yazidi community, particularly against Yazidi women. There are allegations of a genocide being committed against them by ISIS terrorists where women, Yazidi women were forced into sexual slavery by the Islamic State. So that is why you should know about this community. So this completes my discussion of the Hindu analysis for today. Please take down the practice questions. It's all related to what we have studied and I expect you to write answers and post them in the comment section below. I hope you guys have liked today's session and understood everything. If you did, please let me know in the comments. Do press the like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. That is it for today. I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for watching.